Well, welcome to this afternoon European uh, tutorial. Uh, we will have uh, one tutorial per month or even more. Uh, today, Edward Gibson from MIT USA uh, will be our speaker. Well, Edward is doing a lot of things. Uh, I mean, uh, morphology, syntax, pragmatics, computational linguistics, uh, cognitive, whatever. Well, I remember in <laughs> 2005, uh, I gave a seminar. It was a conference in Gothenburg, Sweden. And at this time, I was talking about the forthcoming x link conference. And there, I'm talking about the new generation of linguists. At my time as a student, people were doing other phonology, syntax, or whatever, hardly any interdisciplinary. Uh, and this is the genesis of Experimental Linguistic Conference. We would like to work together and not reinvent the cycle. Uh, well, reading a little bit uh, Ted's work, I was very impressed. Things I was just imagining some, some time ago. So, he is a brilliant ex example of this, which I called then the new generation of linguists. So, Edward is this one, the new strong generation of linguists. We will enjoy him and then we will talk with him. Comments, questions, whatever. Edward, please, the word is yours. Okay, thank you, Antonis. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's uh, funny to be considered the new generation of linguists, but I'm, uh, I've been around for a while, actually. And so, uh, but anyway, my, I feel like my students are the new generation, like my ex, some of my ex-students and stuff, they're the real new generation. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm almost 60, believe it or not. And so uh, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the new generation, but anyway, um, but it's nice to <laughs> be thought of that way. Anyway, so my background in, uh, for your uh, general interest, I um, did uh, my bachelor, I'm Canadian, I'm from Toronto, Canada. And I, uh, oh, and if you look at my photo, of course, I don't look like my photo right now because I've been in lockdown for a year and or almost and my hair is just like there you go I did not cut it uh, since for over a year now and that's and that's what it looks very different from my photo just but it's mostly just my hair that photo is pretty recent on the website there it's like 2017 I think but anyway I, I did um, computer science and math actually undergrad not linguistics at and in Canada in a place called Queen's University and then I did a master's at Cambridge in England on computers computational linguistics and um, then I did a PhD in computational linguistics also at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And uh, it was in those, in those years where after doing computer science undergrad that I, I was, I just found language fascinating. Uh, I, and uh, I just found, I, I sort of read some of the psych literature, the psychology and linguistics literature about language. And I, I, I thought there was uh, lots of interesting things. To, so fast, so many fascinating phenomena and um, a lot of room to study these things um, from a computational and I had to learn the psychology. I was not trained as a psychologist, I was trained as a computer scientist. Uh, I, and so I had to learn that actually as a postdoc, um, how to do sort of cognitive science. And then I, I got a job at MIT and uh, as, a, uh, as a professor in, two, in 1993 and I've been there for um, whatever that is, 27, 27 years since then. And, and so as an assistant professor, and I've been, uh, you know, uh, I'm now, I've been a full professor here for a while at MIT. And, and I've just been interested in anything to do with language um, above the sort of sound level. So above the sort of the word, the, the morpheme and above. So how, how meaning is uh, formed. So the, the four meaning combinations and how that, how that happens in real time and, uh, and, and why, 
that how it happens in real time might um, what what effects that might have for why language looks the way it does in in recent years. That's what I've very been very interested in. And so I'm going to start sharing screen. Um, I mean, I, you know, Antonis said I should maybe uh, you know say a little more. Uh, maybe I can say you know who I am and stuff. I, another thing I did is I've done. A, I used to do. I used to row a lot, believe it or not. And so I did rowing as a. Uh, as, as, as a high school student and a college student. And so I, I, I rode very seriously. I rode for um, the Canadian national team and uh, at the Olympics in 1984. And, uh, and I rode for Cambridge in the Oxford Cambridge boat, boat race, if people know what that is. And, uh, and that was really very interesting and very interesting experience also. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. And I'm going to try to See if tell me if this works. It should work. Maybe that works. Here we go. So people see this, I assume, Hatonis or uh, Athena. Yeah, you see this. Uh, yeah, my this my, perfect. my yeah. title slide. Okay. So what I'm going to do here today in this um, uh, tutorial session is talk about work, uh, which is isn't. I mean, it's a little recent, but it's not that recent. It's from the last sort of eight years. Uh, some of this stuff in the last eight nine years. And so I'm, I'm really just tell you three things three things. And so if you already know this, some of these things, the, the most recent of these is really 2017, 2018. So if you've already seen me give this, these kinds of talks, then um, you won't learn too much, <laughs> I don't think. So these are a tutor really a tutorial session about some of my research program, some of it, um, and not actually the, the most recent things we're doing, but some of the, um, I think some of the coolest generalizations that we found in uh, a, a across languages, some of those, um, in uh, in recent years, and so what I'm going to talk about is information processing across linguistic universals. And um, I'll just tell you my research program. What I'm the first part here is uh, I, I as I say started with language processing, how it is that we understand and produce simple you know simple sentences, complicated sentences, how compli how the how it is that understanding we, we, we produce complicated things might inform how the simple stuff is, is being produced and comprehended. And then I, I've been sort of more, more recently trying to understand how that process of comprehension and production uh, might affect how language looks, okay? So things like information theory, memory, how they make, may shape what language looks like. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, in other things my, my group has been doing, I've been doing for the last several years is looking at noisy channel models of language processing. I'm not really gonna talk about that today, but it's sort of an information theoretic approach to how the process of production and comprehension works in real time. And we try to understand how that works in reading and listening measures across typical populations and other kinds of populations, for instance, people with uh, brain damage. Um, to uh, to language language areas so aphasic uh, populations um, and uh, th that also plays out interestingly in prosody and in, in intonation in some interesting ways in the in, in stress but I'm, as I say, I'm not going to talk about that um, another sort of uh, general line of research that I work on is you know, uh, what is syntax semantics <laughs> what is you know what what is syntax within a language and across languages and um, so there's a standard, the sort of standard approach in some ways, you know, the most famous approach, I guess, is the generative Chomskyan approach. Um, and it's been very um, influential in suggesting that there's these generalizations across constructions, which are unlearnable uh, w within a language and across languages. And so the, the, the hypothesis is there's, there's a universal grammar, which is, un, is just part of our, um, our uh, native being. And uh, an alternative, I mean, I, I am a computer scientist. I find that um, a little unconvincing because the data there wasn't very convincing for, to me anyway. And so we've been, I've been working with linguists uh, uh, pursuing um, really other old ideas that have been around for a really, really long time to discourse basis for these syntax sem 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 semantic effects. People like uh, Nomi Erktik Shear since the early 70s have been pushing these kinds of ideas. And I think these ideas are, uh, I find them much more plausible, and we've done a lot of experimental work suggesting that um, things that look like they might be unlearnable are actually completely learnable in terms of something like a construction grammar way of thinking about things, we think. Okay, and that's work with um, uh, Anne Bayé and Barbara Hemforth and Elodie Winkle at the University of Paris, um, working with 
frameworks like Adele Goldberg's construction grammar, um, uh, Ray Jackendoff's um, kind of way of thinking about what syntax and semantics are in, in within the realm of discourse. I, I don't just do actually language stuff. We also work on higher level cognition. I'm not going to talk about that, but we work on number. Why, you know, how it, why it is, or what the generalizations are about how number um, is um, come to learn, be learned or acquired by humans. Um, and so I work with a couple of remote populations there, uh, the Piraha and the Chimani. I'm going to say more about those. Those are um, Amazonian remote populations. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, my methods are usually behavioral. So this is the Experimental Linguistic Society. This is what I do. I do experiments on any on anything languagey, basically, and, and not even not just language, but in other other higher level cognition. We don't do just English. We do cross linguistic, cross cultural. We do corpus analyses. Uh, stuff I'm going to talk about today is corpus analyses and large large scale cross um, uh, cross language um, uh, corpora here. Um, for the most part, and we do computational modeling, and I work with other people who do brain imaging. I myself, I'm not trained in the brain, as a brain imager, but um, F. Benarenko's group here at MIT, uh, they're some of the best in the world, and they work on the neural basis of language, among other things, and I work with them on that. So, and the populations I work with, as I sort of alluded to there, it's not just Western educated, sort of typical people that who are actually here attending the talk, not like just like us, but people from not just countries like ours and ours industrialized countries, but people from remote non-industrialized cultures, such as the Piraha in Amazonia in Brazil or the Chimani in Amazonia, Bolivia. The reason I mention these is I've done field work. I do extensive field work with the Chimani. I've done a little bit of field work with the Piraha. Um, if we want to know why language looks the way it does, uh, you know, across the whole of human language, then we don't want to look at English, just English, or just French, or just German, or just Greek, or just Ger or just uh, Russian, or just Japanese. You know, these are distinct languages with interesting different properties, but they also are uh, have you know confounding factors of um, all living in similar cultures. Really, I mean, there are differences among these cultures, of course, but there's a lot of exchange of cultural information among these, and so we want to look at more remote uh, cultures as well. And so I happen to have had access to initially the Piraha and now the Chimani, which are remote, non-industrialized populations. One's a hunter-gatherer and one's a, um, almost a hunter-gatherer. They're actually farmer foragers, but they're very remote and they have very, very little contact with um, uh, industrialized populations to some degree. Okay, so, um, I, and so that's, I think that's important when we want to look at how language, uh, why it looks the way it is, we want to look at not just a language that I speak. So it's a different kind of framework, I think. Uh, I think everyone believes this, it's just not everyone does this, okay? Not everyone goes out there and tries to figure out what's going on. Everyone knows that, of course, we have to, it's not just about English or, or, uh, or, or German or something, but we have to go and, and look at these other languages. Um, and so, as I say, I've been in recent years interested in language processing, and I've been interested in how, because of my sort of my my actually really my the students that have happened to come to work with me at MIT, I've been very fortunate being at MIT in the brain and cognitive science department to have um, really very brilliant people just come to want to work with me. And uh, I mean, I think it's partly because I work on a really interesting topic. It's language, and it's because it's MIT people you know, know that there's lots of interesting and smart people at MIT and they just come there. And I have been very fortunate to have um, really brilliant people in the, in recent years who want to work on these, on these um, topics. And, and so that's why I sort of moved in part to try to think of why language looks the way it does. It's a fascinating problem. There are of course many languages all over the world, depending on how you count something like six or 7,000 from 150 or more distinct families and they're obviously very different from one another, which is really obvious if you try to learn another language. So you have to learn a new set of sounds, a new set of words or, or morphemes, um, and, and a new way of putting all these things together. Um, and our group, however, is, is pursuing the idea um, that find figure out the ways in which languages are actually similar. We're pursuing the hypothesis that languages might be evolved for efficient use, and we're looking for universals across many languages. Um, and so in order to do this, we examine forms in, of words and sentences in, in big texts and experiments across many languages. I'm going to tell you about three of those cases today. Um, and 
this is not the way that language and linguistics research is normally taught. So an intro linguistics class doesn't normally start with, you know, here's, here's, what, a, here's what a dictionary looks like. Here's, and, and here's what sort of word combinations look like. And here's how they look across many, many languages. That's not how it normally goes. It's normally, this is English or whatever language is here. And here's some details of English. And isn't this cool? It's not like that's not cool. English is very cool. But um, all languages are, are very interesting. And if we want to look, we want to talk about human language and not just about English or German or, or Greek, then we, uh, we, we need to look at um, data from many languages, uh, you know, at, somehow at the same time. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. And we've been looking at elements of meaning within language. I, I just, that's what I happen to be most interested in. So morphemes are words and how they get put together in syntax. And so that's what I'm going to be concentrating on today. Um, and, you know, our, I guess, prior here, our prior, my baseline guess is like, because language is used for transferring information in social environments, um, other, other people as well, many recent theories have sought to quantitatively test whether languages may be under pressure to be structured so as to facilitate communication. And so modern work in that area, in this area, builds on what's called um, you know, usage-based linguistics, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is Joan Bybee uh, um, and Adele Goldberg and others. Um, and then we formalize, we try to formalize some aspects of those and quantit quantitatively evaluate some of these ideas using some tools of information theory um, you know, from Shannon. Um, and, uh, and today I wanna to tell you about, so I, this is gonna be a, uh, it's really sort of three test cases um, looking at words aspects of words and aspects of syntax. And it's, it's a, so I'm not giving you a framework for what language is necessarily, for what words are and what, what combinations are, but I'm, I'm giving you evidence that communication and um, I'm gonna to try to give you evidence that communication and memory affect the way that language looks, okay? So that's the idea and you know, I, if, if, so it's, these are just kind of pressures. I'm not giving you a formalization here of what it actually is, of what the, what, you know, so I'm, I'm guessing it's something like um, uh, construction grammar is, is my guess is where we're going for this, but I, I don't, but I don't know. That's like an empirical question of how that's gonna end up, okay? So I'm gonna to talk to you about um, three things. So it says here four, there's two things from words there and two in sentence structure, I'll tell you what they are. So in the, in the realm of words, I'm going to tell you some very simple, a simple um, result from uh, Steve Piantadosi that uh, across a bunch of languages that words are short when they're predictable, when they're, when they're both common and predictable. Um, and then, so that's just like a form, a question about what words, the form of words look like. And then, you know, why do we have words at all? Well, one aspect of why we have words in the, in the, in the content realm is that we have words to describe objects and properties uh, of things that we want to talk about, we want to convey to other people, okay, we want to interact with. And so I'm going to, there in that second part, I'm going to talk about uh, the domain of color and how an information theoretic, a, a theoretic I, I, um, framework can explain, can help to explain generalizations uh, uh, across how languages across the world divide up the color space in their labeling. And then in the third part, I'm going to talk about not just words, but how words get put together. And that is in the sentence structure. And, and the idea here is that maybe um, dependencies, so the, uh, the, the structure in a sentence might be easy if we can uh, keep those dependency the, the things that we're going to want to put together close together in some way or other. We're going to start with, it says here, start with old, build a new, but also keep things close. And then the last thing there, you know, to be, I'm not going to touch on because uh, we uh, have finite time <laughs> and I want to keep it at um, sort of an, I, I'm, I'm shooting here for an hour. It's, I've been talking for 12 minutes, it says here. So I'm going to talk for around 40, 48 more minutes. I hope that's okay. And then you, at the end, I mean, if people want to talk, please just turn off your unmute and you can just interrupt me during this talk. And um, I can, it, it, for clarification questions, for detailed questions about, you know, sort of thought provoking questions, we can come back at the end, I hope, for a, 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 a long discussion period, well, as long as people are interested in being here. Okay. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. First one, words. There's three parts, as I say, one part, words. And I'm going to talk about form of words. This is not meaning of word, just form. And a production here, the proposed universal here is that um, 
contextual predictability will predict the size of words, how long they are across languages. That's okay. So the idea here is it's really an old idea um, that uh, it goes back to Zip and probably before. Okay, this is this linguist at Harvard in the 30s called George Kingsley Zip. It's a great name. I like his middle name, Kingsley. Anyway, um, he, his idea is very in a very obvious idea is that it'd be easier for me and easier for you as a speaker and here if I if to, to convey the same meanings I didn't have to say so much I could I could be more compressed okay so that would mean that the the things that I say the most should be shorter and the things that I say the least could be longer to make that code uh, optimal in some way okay and so frequent words should be short is his idea that's the zip idea okay and it's true so zip uh, zip looked at a few uh languages and more people have looked at that since and it since and it's true that there's strong relationships between frequency and word length and so high in english high frequency words tends to tend to be short and low frequency words tend to be long there's some correlation there it's it's imperfect but it, this is one of those pressures on 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 words word shape in this way okay on you know morpheme or word shape okay meaning shape here okay not meaning the form form shape associated with uh meanings okay so i just have some examples there you know guy men war whatever these are all short words and they're high frequency and the long words down there stratification reluctantly and so on these are longer words and they're much lower frequency and what um steve piantidosi who was a student of mine uh, back around, I guess he graduated in 2011 or so, um, noted was there's lots of words that were very short, but also infrequent. And why, how could that be under an information theoretic uh, point of view? And his idea is that, well, maybe it's not, uh, so I'll just give you some examples here. So a word like aback is only two syllables in English, and it's an incredibly low, low frequency word. And a word like yonder, also two syllables, very, very low frequency. Hardly, these hardly ever occur, and any, any people hardly ever say them, and they, probably, and they hardly ever uh, write them. And yet, they're very short. How can they exist? And, and the idea is that they can be short because um, they're, uh, they're kind of very predictable in the local context. So some short words can exist because they're predictable in the local context. So instead of thinking of a word length being having to be um, high frequency independent of context, if we just think of it frequency relative to the context, as long as the local context makes that very accessible, then I can, I can make it very, very, very predictable, then I can make it short. And so the idea is, you know, when do you say a back? A back only occurs after some form of take. So like I was taken aback. So it's like, I don't even know if you can say it after any other form of take, frankly. It's like, I guess, you could, I don't even know. It seems it's always passive as well. And then yonder almost always occurs after some preposition like over yonder. So there's like some combination there such that the word yonder and the word aback are very predictable from some other words in the context, which are, and so that makes them, you can make them shorter because you, you don't have to say so much. That's the idea. Okay. And so all he did then, Steve Piantidosi, was let's quantify that, you know, um, in some in some way and so he just used the notion of surprisal which is the negative log probability of a word uh, given a context here and and the context here is an incredibly simple notion of context it's just the preceding two words or the preceding three words or the preceding one word so then if it's preceding two words we've got sequences of three words the third word is the one we're, we're interested in and uh we can look at the predictability across all contexts for that word and the idea is that a word like a back is very predictable because always take is almost always in there. Some form of take is right before it. And same with yonder, almost always there. So the predictability measure, that negative log probability is very high. It's very predictable for these, um, for these short words. And then we just look at the predictability against, instead of frequency, now we're looking at predictability measured against length. And we see if that's um, a better predictor of word length. I should notice that this is not a claim that this is what the only notion of predictability that humans are sensitive to. Of course, we have other kinds of predictability we're sensitive to. So we're sensitive to long distance dependencies in language, for example. Um, and this is not going to account for that. Uh, so the context will allow more, but this is a very simple measure that we can, we can measure in huge corpora. Okay, we can look at giant corpora, whatever language, if we just look at the sequences of three words, it's very easy to measure this. And so in 2009, Google released these n-grams, which are these sequences of, you know, two or three or four words across many languages, 11 languages. And so here, I think you can see my cursor. Here's one of the languages is English. I happen to speak this one. <laughs> 
don't think we have Greek here actually. So that's what Greek, this is what um, uh, Google released in 2009. And you see these dashed lines, the dashed bars here are the Ziffian relationship between word frequency and word length. And you can see that they're all highly reliable above zero. Like they're not that big. The number is 0.1 to 0.2, you know, you know, so it's a correlation, which is, you know, high, very robust, but small. And um, there's a bigger um, effect for predictability um, correlated with, with length. And so that's like 0.3 or something on average here. And it's bigger in every language. The predictability, this is you know, the predictability measure against word length is bigger in every language. And we can look at the, these, these, these triangles inside these bars are the leftover a correlation after you partial out the other factors. So after I partial out frequency, how is predictability doing? Well, it's actually pretty much the same. If I partial out predictability and look at frequency, oh, this almost goes away. Suggesting that the frequency one on its own, just it, the unigram frequency on its own doesn't do that much. And really it's predictability that's kind of doing it all in all these languages. And so that's, so I mean, uh, Zip would have been very happy with that. Zip just didn't have access to big corpora. He couldn't measure, I mean, some, would, some corpora, but he can measure sort of unigram frequency, but it's hard to measure these bigram and trigram frequencies with corpora of not very large size. You know, the, the corpora here in English, we're talking about, you know, trillions of words. It's not, not a few million words. It's like, this is Google n-grams, it's trillions of words. And so maybe it's more by now even, I don't even know. It's, these are, I mean, so English was happened to be the largest of these corpora at the time, but they're, and I'm sure it still is. I just don't know what these numbers are now. Oh, and, and Steve looked at, and other people have looked at many other languages. I mean, not that many. You need to have big corpora in each one of these languages to be able to evaluate them, but, but set many other, and they all kind of look the same here. Okay. So the simple idea here is that communication, uh, something about information theory, this predictability is shaping the way that words look. When uh, and and other people have done lots of interesting things, sort of investigating this idea uh, for in, in uh, further. And it's you know, the idea is just that we we want to shorten things. We want to make things easier on us as producers. Easier on. Not, I'm not exactly sure why. Is is it for me, the speaker? Is it for you, the listener? I'm I'm going to guess it's for me, the the, the speaker. But that's actually an empirical question. If maybe the reason I'm shortening things is to make it easier for you to understand what I'm saying, like so you don't have to listen to me so much, or is it because I don't wanna talk so much to make it easier for myself? I mean, I feel pretty selfish, so I feel like it's about me and not about you, but I don't know. <laughs> that's an empirical question, which people are investigating, and in it's a very interesting question. This is this audience design question. Am I structuring my language for you, or am I doing it just for me and, um, uh, and, and it happens then that those things are good for you as well. These things work together. Okay, so that's the first thing that um, I'm gonna, the first result. And that, one, that one's the kind of sh the shortest. Then we had, I have two more things I want to tell you. If my thing will go forward, there we go. The second one is um, this, not just form of words, but the meanings of words. Okay, so we're inventing words the idea here is we're inventing words for property, like for in the, in the realm of content words for properties or, or um, names of things in the world that, well, for properties, we're doing it for properties of objects that differentiate them from other objects is the idea. And so that seems like a pretty obvious idea, right? So why do we have like, but, but if you haven't thought about it, just think about it for a second. Like, why do we have words at all? Uh, you know, uh, in, in the communication idea, it's like, it's because I want to tell you about something. It's not because I, it's, you know, I, I it's because I need to, for, and so I'm going to talk about color. Why do I have a, all these color labels? Well, maybe it's because I have objects which are identical and I need to tell you which one, which of those two objects I want to give, you, you want you to give me, or I want to give to you or something like that. And so I have two, two shirts and one's red and one's blue and I want to tell, and they're identical except for the color Then I need a word to tell you to be able to communicate in that in words, which which one to give you, you know, which one you want, right? Um, it's not that under the communication idea. It's not just because the colors are beautiful, because they're fascinating to us. Okay, so so that so then that's going to differentiate because we see that like so the, the the colors we see in the environment are actually the same across all kinds of cultures. And for some reason, industrialized cultures have way more words, way more labels for colors than um, uh, non-industrialized cultures. And so the the communication idea potentially explains that is like that's because we have objects which are just different on color and we need the words to differentiate those so that's that's the idea i'm working with here and, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain all that in a second i'll give you evidence for that okay it's quite different from the default depending on what when you've come into the color naming game 
Um, this is not the standard idea. It's becoming the standard idea because I think in part because of our work and others, but it wasn't up until 2017. So here's a project which um, uh, it came out in 2017. Well, one of the papers, leading papers on this came out in 2017. It's you know, led by me and this guy, Bevel Conway, who's a, a, um, a vision scientist at NIH, at the National Institutes of Health. And he does uh, monkey uh, experiments looking at neurophysiology, and he's interested in how color is implemented in the brain, okay? And so how we, you know, how we see color, how that works in, in, in seeing, okay? And so I happened to run into him at a meeting a while ago, you know, back in 2014 or 15, and we started talking, and that's how this project got, start, got started. And other people have been really fundamental in this work. I should mention Richard Futrell, I'll come back to him, and Kyle Mahuwald and Leon Bergen were actually, these three over here were really important to this. Oh, and Julian Hart Edinger as well. These people were all amazing on this project. So, um, okay, color. In case you don't know about color, normal, if you have normal vision, which means you have three cones to dis distinguish in your, in, your, um, in your eyes, you, in, your, in your brain, you have three cones to be able to distinguish uh, uh, color. And it's called trichromatic vision. You can see literally millions of different colors. You can, see, you can differentiate millions of different colors. That's if you're not colored one, okay? Um, but our language system categorizes these into a very small set of words, okay? So in a, in a, in a language like English and Greek and all of industrialized cultures, Everyone will know at least 11 words, something like 11, and maybe, maybe it's 12 or 13, depending on the language, okay, that everyone knows. But then if you do something, if you're an interior designer, you're a painter or something, you will know many more than that. You may know 100 words, okay? Um, okay, 100 sounds like a lot, but it, it's, it's probably an exaggeration. It's probably not even 100, but even if it were 100, you see millions, okay? You see like you know, maybe 10 million, you can distinguish 10 million and you're breaking it down into a hundred categories. Okay. That's a tiny fraction of what you can see. Okay. So there's a categorization problem here where we're using the language to break this down. Okay. We're, we're breaking down the thing we can see into some small fraction of what we can see. We're putting these things together. And very interestingly, the ways that languages categorize color is very different across languages. So most different, most different across non-industrialized cultures. In industrialized cultures, it's kind of the same, probably because it's a lot of cultural transmission that's going on here. The words that we use are, we wanna be able to talk about exactly the same things across all our industrialized cultures. And what we wanna do, and what we, we ended up wanting to do in this project, I didn't actually set out that way, but we, we ended up wanting to do is trying to understand why cultures vary so much. And, and we're gonna use information theory and communication to do that. So. Um, this is this this little figure here is 80 colors um, in, in the so-called Munsell uh, perceptual space. So color can be divided perceptually into three representational dimensions, the so-called three-dimensional color ball, where light and dark, the luminance are kind of up on the top. So there's the light is up top and the, the, the black is down here. And this is around the surface of the ball. You can imagine that. Um, thing around the surface of the ball. And as you go into the center, you get grays. Okay, these are the bright ones. These are the so-called saturated colors on the outside of the ball, the bright ones. And the wheel, the color wheels around the center, what you think of the color wheel around the, around the equator of this ball. And this representational space was uh, invented, discovered, developed by uh, this guy Munsell, who was a vision scientist and a painter. And he did that over a hundred years ago. And what he did was a bunch of very fine-tuned um, uh, perceptual experiments where he uh, figured out how close together colors were perceptually, purely perceptually, how close they were. So he decided, he worked out for hundreds and thousands, thousands of colors, how close they were together perceptually, like basically how easily you could tell, not millions, he didn't, but he did thousands, how, they, how you could figure out uh, how close these things were, uh, easily, how, how similar they looked to, to, to participants, and how easily you could tell them apart. Okay, that's like perceptual um, uh, discrimination and similarity are the kinds of experiments he did. Okay, and, and so then this is a space which is um, defined perceptually such that any two squares in this, on this space are equally close perceptually, equally far away perceptually. That's, that's the point of the Munsell space. So he's defining, he set this stuff up and other groups 
there's no truth to this yet. We actually don't know the truth of how color vision works, okay, in humans. We don't know this. And so this is one theory, actually. The Munsell one's another, and there's a couple of other theories out there. They all have these kinds of properties where you can set up a perceptual space like this, but they're not exactly the same. It's, this, is, this is not like facts, okay? These are theories also, just to make sure you understand this. It's not, but it's like, these things are general across the various theories. Okay, and so, but fascinatingly, languages are really different. English, and you know all of the languages we speak here on this like the industrialized language cultures have at least 11 terms that everyone knows but if you go to non-industrialized cultures you'll find they have many fewer and so a language like Barinmo, i mean there's just two examples that have been studied in in the in the literature Barinmo is one that was studied by riverstone et al which is on in papua new guinea it has only five terms that people know uh most people know and then the danai is a really interesting group which has only two terms, only basically has black and white and doesn't talk about anything else in the middle. Okay, and that's uh, you know by Eleanor Roche famously back in the uh, 70s. And you know, the point of Eleanor Roche's work was just to show that, was to show that these, even though they only had two terms, they, they see the same thing. Okay, it's not like they don't have color vision, they have perfect color vision and they can do the perceptual experiments the same way as you and I can do them, they just don't have words for them, they just don't talk about it. Okay, so we wanna distinguish language for this domain, which is what I'm interested in, from like being able to see and they have color vision just fine. And, and so that's a, another question, this question of, you know, how the language we speak might affect what we see. And the answer is not much, frankly, but there is some, there are some interesting uh, small details where they are different. That's the Worfian question, which I'm not going to talk about here. What I want to not talk about is why different languages have the different sets of terms that they have. And the most famous theory of this is Berlin and Case, okay? So Berlin and Kay were um, anthropologists, linguists from uh, Berkeley in the 60s. And uh, they, 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 they did some really neat data, data collection. Um, and uh, they, they built something called the World Color Survey. Originally, it was just 20 languages. And they used these Munsell chips that I was, telling, I was telling you about before, okay? So that's why I'm using Munsell chips. Other people use Munsell chips. We use those, okay? And, and their original data set was uh, 20 languages. More recently, well, in the 90s, 99, they gathered data from 110 languages. Those 110 languages are all um, non-industrialized cultures. And what they observed in that first 20 languages, not the 110, was um, that there's like a total order, it looked like, um, between the... Um, uh, a total order in how words for colors come into a language. So if a language only has two color terms, they're always black and white. That's like the Danai. If a, if a language has three color terms, then it, the third term was always red. If a, if a language has four terms, then it would be these three plus green or blue, sorry, green or yellow. And if it's five, then it's plus the other of those. And if it's six, then it's these six. So it's a total order is what they observed. Um, in how and how languages are bringing terms into uh, into their their set of color terms, and so what they guessed because there was this total order, this this subset relationship, they guessed that maybe the color color categorizations across languages were due to the visual system to how people see color. Maybe black, white, and red are the most salient things in the visual system, and so they're labeled first, uh, and so on. And so that's. And, and they thought this would bottom out in neurophysiology. So we'd see this in neurophysiology of color vision uh, and, and that, that we'd work out that way. But that has not happened, okay? So uh, that's their hypothesis. Turns out probably wrong, okay? Uh, I'd say totally, clearly wrong at this point, okay? So part, I don't, you know, there's some, there's some parts of it which may be right in some ways, but I think this, there's like a, a lot of issues here. And so, you know, so that's their hypothesis visual system. But you know, one, the subset relationship doesn't really hold up. Like this, this hypothesis was driven originally by these 20 languages who, who are all turns out bilinguals. So like these are people they could access in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so these are all bilinguals. I, I've said this to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I don't know, they're worried about, I, I feel like there's a danger of Anglo-centricity here. And so because there's a bilingual with English, they're thinking about this in English terms and like English and it's like all languages are like English is kind of the way. And another hypothesis is they're not, you know, maybe they were just all different and, and maybe it's about what people want to talk about and what we want to talk about might not be the same as what people in, in remote cultures want to talk about for some, in, in some, to some degree. Okay. And uh, I think that hypothesis is becoming uh, uh, more, is better supported than this sort of universal idea, okay? And, uh, and so, um, yeah, where am I here? So, 
Yeah. So this, I just want to say, there's there's no neurophysi no neurophysiological evidence for this for this total order. There are these subset relationship violations. So like that doesn't look like this for really for a, like some languages. They just look kind of different. Like the the the, the ways that languages divide up the color space isn't universal like this. There are, there are some interesting generalizations which we can, uh, which I can talk about if necessary, but we're not, I'm not gonna talk about here. So what I wanna do here, let's take it, well, there's three questions I wanted, we sort of, where, where we were started here. What, is there a cross-linguistic universal component to color naming? And the answer is gonna be yes, uh, but it's not the one that Berlin and Kay were saying. And if so, why? We're, so if so, what is it? And I'm going to tell you it's just that um, warm colors are easier to name than cool colors. And so it's so there's more and and that that's and then why and and why is that? Is that's because maybe um, uh, warm colors label or warm colors are associated with objects and cool colors are associated with backgrounds. And so the way that the reason we label warm warm things in most in all color languages, every sorry every language of the world has more terms in the warm color space than the cool color space because probably because um, the objects are warm colored and the, and the backgrounds are cool. So what we mean by cool, we mean like blues and greens, right? Blues and greens is background, it's the sky, it's the, it's the, it's the trees, it's the, it's the leaves, it's the, it's, the, it's the water. That stuff, stuff, we don't wanna talk about that stuff. We, you know, it's there and it's, it's really pretty, you know, so sky actually is all variable in, in color depending on the type of time of day, you know, with the sunset, sunrise, it's the sunrise, sunset especially, beautiful, all these varies, but we don't need to talk about that. There's no objects that we need to label there. Uh, the objects we want to label are, you know, other humans, other anim animals, berries, you know, uh, these kinds of things which have very d distinct colors from the backgrounds. And so those are the, maybe the things we want to label in these languages. So, but to, to do this, we need another way to think about this. Well, I think, which is like, no, no, let's just think about this information theoretically. Okay, so let's think about this, the, the information theoretic way of thinking about color or, or anything, but color here. And so, when we talk about what I mean by information theoretic, say I've got this, um, this, this set of colors and I want to transmit one of them to you. Okay. I want to tell you about something and it, and it has a particular color. So I want to tell you about, you know, a blue shirt as opposed to a red shirt or a green shirt or whatever. I use a word blue to convey that idea. And the idea is in, in the information theoretic question is like, how many, how, well, do I communicate that idea to you using that word? And what do you mean by well? Well, it's like information theoretically, it's like how many bits of information does it take to get the right answer to you? And what, what I mean by the right answer is which color did I, like say there's 80 of these evenly spaced colors across this grid, how many guesses does it, so which are kind of yes, no bits, how many guesses does it take you to narrow in on the one I meant given the word that I used, okay? So I'm not actually saying that we're going to do that task. We're figuring out how many these guesses, but that's a way to think of how well I can transmit a, a meaning for, uh, for a, a word using a word. Okay. And so for any particular color in this grid, the, the number, the easier, the, 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 um, the goodness of that transmission depends on two things. It depends on how reliably a color chip is labeled. So, this color chip here, maybe almost everyone will call red. And so we can very strongly agree that that thing is red. You can see my mouse, right? Can you give me a thumbs up there, Antonis? I hope you can see my mouse. Can people see my mouse? Is anyone here? Athena? Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm not getting any. Yes, yes, I just posted yes. Oh, yeah, everything oh, so is fine. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. I'm just looking at people on the. I can see some people faces, but I can't, uh, I don't have the chat open. Sorry. Sorry about that. Ah, I can see I could open that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So that one there is, uh, most people will agree maybe in English that we call that red, but over here, you know, somewhere between a green and a blue, we, there's probably a lot of, um, variability in what people might label that, for example. Um, and, uh, and so there's like a, there's a certain amount. So for, we can get a distribution of labels, uh, over colors. That's a probability of word given a color. And how do I do that? I can ask 50 people, just tell me what, what color is this? What color is this? What color is this? Do this over and over and over and I get a distribution of those labels. And maybe 90% of the time people say red for this. And maybe, you know, most of the time people say orange for this, but there's a lot, maybe there's a lot more variability in among some of these ones. I, I mean, it's, it's an open question. And I, I mean, I say know the answer because I've done that, but I mean, that's, that's what you, you care about. Okay. And then that's only half of the problem though. The other half of the problem is if you get a word, 
uh, how can you, can you which so if, I, if you hear me say red or you hear me say green which which chip do you think I meant okay that's the probability of color given a word that's also affects how easily how how easy it is to convey a, um, a color given a word and so that's like the surprisal the negative log probability of the color dip given the word like so maybe there's eight chips that were called green or something or something like and, and so I had to pick among those eight chips. So there's the negative log probability that's like three bits. It's going to take me to figure out which one I meant of those. And maybe there's fewer, it turns out there are fewer um, around red. Like these, it turns out that, well, anyway, so the, the, we can multiply those two together and get the average number of bits it takes to, to convey optimally any, um, particular color here, the score for a color across all the different words that might be used, and we can get this, this measure here, and that's the number of bits it might take. And the question that the information theoretic um, characterization opens up is, are they all equally uh, um, uh, uh, transmittable? And the answer is no. Okay, there's huge differences in how easily they are to uh, transmit across every language. And so this, the warm things tend to be easier to, to convey than the cool things, these things in the middle, okay? Um, and you don't get that without doing an information theoretic analysis. That's what the information theoretic analysis gets you to start with. If you don't, if you don't do it, you can't do it. And I'm, I'm not saying we're the first to do this. People like Terry Regeer at uh, University of California, Berkeley, he's been pushing information theoretic analyses of this kind of system for a while. And his... Um, a sort of ex-student of his, Noga Zavslavsky, works on information theoretic um, uh, approaches to this and other domains, color domain, and she's just amazing. If you want to find the latest uh, sort of information theory approaches to color and other things, she's like the best person to do that, actually. Okay, but I'm not actually going to talk about her work. I'm talking about ours. Her, hers comes a little bit after ours. Um, so the critical thing um, we observe here is, well, well, we ask is all color, are all colors equally easy to communicate or is distribution skewed? Turns out it's skewed. Um, we, how did this project start? I'm just noticing the time here. Um, uh, I, I mean, I told you I went, I worked with, I talked to Bevel Conway, I went down, I was working with the Chimani on a bunch of things. Uh, so the Chimani are this remote population in Bolivia. Uh, okay, here, this, um, black boundary is Amazonia, okay? It's not a country, and it covers, uh, that's Brazil in the center there, this is Peru, this is Bolivia, this is Colombia, and so that's just Amazonia, and, and so the, the Chimani happen to be in the Bolivian part of the Amazon, this is where the Pirajá are, this there happen to be in, in the um, Brazilian part, and there's another group called the Munduruku, other people have worked with, I don't, I work with these two groups here, but not with them, and um, I actually, you know, I've been, I was interested in number cognition when I was working with the Pirajá, and with the Chimani, it's how it gets started. And the color stuff, um, I was like, oh, all, lots of interesting cognitive questions come up for, for uh, cognitive and language questions come up for these remote groups. And so this is where we start working on color. And so this is what the, they work on. They're on this little river um, called the Maniki. And this is, you know, uh, what, what, what it looks like in their, in their jungle. This is one of their houses. This is their ho one of their houses. This, this house in the background is a, um, a structure that UNICEF built in the, probably late 50s, early 60s, in the middle of a bunch of villages which are pretty close to uh, a, a Spanish town, okay, and in, in Bolivia. And we stay in this Spanish town, it's called San Borja, and we drive from, from there to various villages. Many of them have these UNICEF-centered um, uh, center of town, uh, town hall kind of places where we do often do our experiments. That's where like the, the, the school is in the village if there's, if there's a school in that village. And so that's me with short hair in 2014 or 15 or something. And this guy's our translator. He's got a baseball cap backwards. So he's a native Chimani speaker and he's also bilingual with Spanish and this guy is a guy who only speaks Chimani. He is the teacher actually for w one of these villages and so that's why he's kind of well dressed actually and so uh, the uh, most of the people are sort of less well dressed than him and are my monolingual uh, Chimani. Okay and Chimani I should say is a uh, isolate language and so there's no I mean it's not quite an isolate there's, there's a pair which are unrelated to any other language that we know of at all. There's no, no, we don't know what the connection is. It's like total fascinating, you know, typological question about how, why it is in these remote places like, um, like um, Papua New Guinea and in Amazonia where you get so many of these isolates. And, and probably in part anthropologists you know, agree that it's because they, these, the, 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 the weather is good nothing changes uh, and, and, and so people can just stay there for hundreds of thousands of years. Like, there's no reason to go anywhere 
everything. You've got enough food. You can survive there. Um, there's no re and so then so the the contact although it must have been there at some point we don't know about it because it's so far back and the language has changed so much over time that we don't know where these languages have come from so this is one of those and the piraha is another um, so our task is a really simple task I'm not gonna there's uh, the task is just what color is this <laughs> and we give people all of these chips in a random order this is Bolivian Spanish this is what people do in Bolivian Spanish here's five random Spanish speakers and they just look, they do kind of what you might expect, which is there's some variability, but they all do kind of the same thing. And what I mean by, so in any one of these chips here, it's actually associating with a word, each one, and this is a word, you know, this, uh, you know, you know uh, this is roja for red and so on uh, um, for all the different Spanish words. And so you could see that um, there's some variability between people, but people kind of do the same things. So where the boundaries are is variable. We know that in perception. So my perception of uh, my, my color perception isn't exactly the same as other people's. My the way I label the color space might not be identical the way, to the way you label the color space. Although it's, I probably have some dialect and something. So like you know, there's just famous examples of you know where we think the boundary between green and yellow is in English, for example. There's a famous little cute example I can do. Um, just ask you, you know, what color is a tennis ball? You know, a tennis ball, if you ever watched, you know, Wimbledon or, or, or the US Open, the French Open, that what color is that tennis ball they play with? And uh, half of you will say it's yellow and half of you will say it's green. I'm a yellow person, half of you will say I'm crazy. Okay, and so it's just, that's just on the boundary of where yellow and green is and some people, you know, put it in one way, but that's just, it's not like um, neither of us are right or wrong. There's just slight different dialects there. And I'm not actually sure what that's about. But anyway, all these people agree and there's slight differences, not a big deal. Look at Shimani, it's completely different. Okay, so individuals are, uh, they agree with themselves. They know what they're doing when they're labeling it, but there's big individual variation in how they're labeling the space. They agree on the red, okay, that on the, which shows this, it's a bigger space than in English. They call a lot of this, this the you know, pinky red stuff is all kind of the, their term for red, but the stuff in the middle, a lot of that's very variable across speakers. But it turns out there's sort of two terms that people use for the green blue space, you know, um, and, and they're totally distinct terms, and yet, they're, so for what they, they, it's kind of a GRU language, a green-blue language, GRU, uh, but there's two terms that people use. And one group will use one, another group will use another. So it's not the best for communication, as you might guess, uh, <laughs> because it's hard to communicate colors, but maybe they just don't want to talk about them. So they're, they're individually consistent. This is, and the Shimani are not weird. This is, this is how most of the non-industrialized cultures look around the world, okay? There's like a lot of individual variability. That's part of what, you know, uh, um, if you look at the World Color Survey, you get the same thing. Okay, I just, it's, it's not something that people know when they, they don't, people show sort of individual um, data typically. So they're consistent, but idiosyncratic between people. And so we can do this information theoretic measure of how well does Spanish convey colors and Chimani and English? We can do that. Okay, so and, and so remember, I, I told you it was this score that I could, you know, I get this how much do we agree on every on the color, the label for this, and then the surprisal associated with that. And we multiply those two together. Okay, there's a little trick I have to, I, I, I sort of uh, skipped over there. We can measure half of that. We're measuring the, 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 um, how consistently we label things, but I don't have a measure directly of the surprisal of how, um, how, how surprised you are when I say, um, uh, I, I, uh, I say green and I want you to pick out which chip I mean. And there might be eight or 10 chips that I might, you know, so where I'm getting that from is I'm, I'm so that's like the probability of, I'm, I'm, I'm measuring here the probability of word given color, but I don't have the probability of color given word from this, but I can compute it in a Bayesian way just by, if I, if I assume something for the priors of the probability of word and probability of colors overall, then I can compute that in the, in the same way. So remember that I had this formula, I just skipped over that. So this thing right here is what I'm sort of referring to. I'm measuring this directly. This thing here, I don't, I'm not measuring directly. I'm gonna compute that from this, assuming something about the priors for probability of words. Well, I can get that from the way that people typically label these words in this, in this task. It's not perfect, but it's okay. And, and there's different things I can do for probability of a color, why people talk about color, and maybe take a uniform prior, maybe take some other prior, and then you come up with some similar results. Anyway, so I, can, so I get this measure for every one of those chips, and then I can rank those chips according to how easy or hard they are to convey. And so here's English and Spanish, 
here's Chimani. This is the total order within Spanish, within, Ch within Chimani for, I don't know, 30 speakers. And this is like for more speakers in Chimani, but whatever. It's like 50 speakers in Chimani and there's like 30 in each of English and Spanish. And really interestingly, some chips are easy to convey and some are not. There's a big variability here. It's like one and a half bits. This is the number of bits it takes to convey all the way to five. That's a huge variability in English and Spanish. In Chimani, it starts at three and goes up to almost six. So there's like a, it's a similar curve shifted up by a bit meaning there's much more information. It's easier to convey stuff in Spanish and English than in Chimani. That's not surprising. Uh, that has to be the case because there's more words in Spanish and English and they're using them more consistently. So of course this goes, it's, it's, it's higher. But the thing I want to look at, that, first of all, that's kind of cool. It's like, wow, you, when you do this, you see they're very similar profiles just shifted up. Um, and then what you see is the order is very similar. We've got reds, blues, sorry, sorry reds, um, orange, yellow, black, and white. All this stuff is down here, and the, the, the blues and the greens are up here. Hard to convey blues and greens, easier to convey all the warms, okay? And there's a high correlation between those two. It's the same. Like, they look, they're not identical, but it's correlations here are 0.5 and 0.6, actually, across languages. Very, very high. The generalization here is warm is easy, cool is hard. High surprisal for cool, warm is low. Um, low surprisal, easy to convey. And, and that doesn't, oh, I skipped over something there, just doesn't fit Berlin and K um, and some other theories, unique hues if you happen to know that. So then what we did was like, let's compare this, our data to the World Color Survey data. <clears throat> Here's our data again, and just rank ordered, easiest to convey, hardest to convey. Um, I just put English and Spanish above Chimani because there's more information in English and Spanish and less in Chimani. And now what I'm going to do is throw them into the World Color Survey. World Color Survey is this data that that, Chima that Berlin and Kay, well, they got other people to gather. And so that's 110 other languages, all non-industrialized languages, cultures. And you see that they look the same. The results are the same for every single language. Warm, easy to convey cool, hard to convey. Every single language, it's a cross-linguistic um, generalization. And then why? So, I, I mean, first of all, that graph is amazing. When we first, when we first pr produced that graph, we were just sort of astounded by the, you know, by finding sort of um, regularity in, uh, in the world like that. It's like, wow, that is a really, uh, it's such a fun thing to be able to discover something like that. I have to say that was a really great moment for me and our group, I just thought it was uh, so cool to find that. And then, you know, then trying to understand why, it turns out very plausibly, it's just due, due to objects against backgrounds. Objects are warm, um, backgrounds are cool, tend to be. So what we did to test that is Microsoft happened to have a database that was publicly available, 20,000 images, which they had hand parsed um, for objects versus background. So they went through every object and say which, so every, fi every, fi every picture, it's like photographs of the world, and said, this is the object and the other stuff is the background. Okay, and someone pixel by pixel had done that. They're trying to figure out, like they're doing an AI system which is doing object rec recognition, deciding what's an object versus what's a background, what humans think these things are. And, and we can use that though, just to look at the colors in those things. And so we can look at the probability of a particular color being in an object versus it being in a background. And so here's one language, they all look the same. Um, let's you know, look down here on the bottom right here, we see the cools, um, which are the ones with um, high surprisal, hard to convey, are low probability of being in an object. They're very unlikely, so they're like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. That's this, they're mostly in backgrounds. These things are mostly in backgrounds. And these warm things, mostly in, in objects, more more likely to be in objects. Okay, backgrounds are much bigger than foregrounds in these pictures. There's not much stuff going here. So they, even so, so that's like prob that's why these probabilities are so low of these things being in an object at all. But you know, so the, the intuition is very clear. It's like in every natural scene, you've got a sky, and you have if you're you know in a natural scene around you know there's water around you know there's a bunch of stuff, and then there's any anything with trees and grass and stuff. That's stuff we don't care about. It's background. For the most part, and um, and so that's that's why this is coming out, you know. And so it's like we don't want to label those things. So that's the idea here. So languages will tend to put words in the space. They'll tend to skip over, not put much in this in the so-called cool part of the space. They'll put them in the warm part of the space. So interestingly, before this work, the notion of cool and warm were not actually ever defined. People defined cool and warm in terms of, oh, cool is green and blue, and warm is orange and red and brown. This, this, this. Well, we can define it. The definition of cool versus uh, warm is easy to convey, hard to convey. So it's this part of the space, hard to convey, 
easy to convey over here. These are the things we want to talk about. These things we don't want to talk about backgrounds. So it's cool as background, uh, warm as foreground. <clears throat> and all languages do this. This is English. We throw more words in the warm part of the space. And in many languages, don't even put two words in gru, right? Just put one word in the middle of gru there somewhere. They don't bother with two. Okay, so that's like Chamani. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, there's a neat thing I'm going to skip over here, but I'm just going to skip over. So we, I showed you one thing, cross-linguistic universal, warm, easier to convey than cool, and, and that's plausibly explained by objects versus backgrounds. And then there's this other thing which I'm skipping over, which is maybe that um, it's about industrialization that's bringing uh, the words in. <clears throat> and I can come back to that if people... Um, and that's that's kind of related to my, my observation at the beginning of the talk of this section here was that um, <coughs> we in industrialized cultures have lots of objects which are identical except for their color, whereas in non-industrialized worlds they don't have those. And then we can test some aspect of that within an industrialized culture. And so I, I can tell you about that, but um, I'm going to skip over that. So the last thing I want to do in maybe eight minutes here. <laughs> Um, is talking not just about words, I want to talk about how words get put together. Okay, this is my third little section here. And again, this is not new. This, this came out in 2015. This project here, a bunch of other stuff has been done since. And I'm going to talk about the, the sort of the neat stuff that kind of started it all on this, which is this cool universal about languages minimizing dependency length. So I've been interested in how language, so I actually my, started my career in this whole field and trying to understand um, how people process sentences, you know, word by word and building complex structures for the things they're hearing or reading. And a, a generalization that has occurred across many languages is that there, it does tend to be easier for people to understand more local connections compared to longer distance connections um, in, in um, <laughs> independency structures. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I have this funny example here. Well, I think it's funny. I'm from Toronto. This is, a, this is actually a, a newspaper headline from a, a Toronto newspaper from the 70s when I grew up in Toronto. And uh, it says, Toronto law to protect squirrels hit by mayor. And, and the idea here is that the, the, the newspaper headlines trying to say that the law was attacked, was criticized by the mayor. But it's when you read that headline, it's kind of hard not to notice that maybe the squirrels were hit by the mayor and the law is trying to protect those poor squirrels that were hit by this mayor, which is weird. It just, and so it's a funny headline. And the reason maybe it's funny is that we can't ignore um, local connections. And so you notice them and they're kind of weird. And so here's another example, which makes that same point. You can visit this. This is a translation. This is actually an English translation of, of a Russian um, sign, but it's by some Russian speakers wrote this and in, in an English speaker probably wouldn't have written this because it sounds funny, funny. You can visit the cemetery. So there's a cemetery where the sign's posted where f famous Russian composers are buried daily except Thursday. And so the, the reason that's funny, of course, is that, uh, you know, what's intended is that you're visiting the cemetery. The you could visit the cemetery any day except for Thursday. But what it says is are buried daily except Thursday. And it's very hard to not connect that daily except Thursday to the burying, which is obviously not what's going on and makes it funny. And so there's a dependency structure here. That's how the words are getting put together in any language. Here's English. Here's, so what the, this is a project led by Richard Futrell, who was um, a grad student with me, uh, graduated a couple of years ago, and now he's a faculty member at University of California, Irvine. And uh, the second author here, Kyle Mahawald, is a, uh, also graduated, I guess, four years ago, and he's a faculty member at University of California, Santa Barbara. And I should mention this, you know, Steve Candidosi, that other one, he's at Berkeley. He was a student student with me, and he's a professor at Berkeley. So for some reason, my students have ended up doing very well in the University of California system on the West Coast there. And so, uh, and there's more. There's actually two more. Neil Leon Bergen is at San Diego, and uh, Rachel Riskin, Riskin is at University of California at Merced. And I don't know why California likes our work so much, but it's great. Um, and so here's what Richard did. He took dependency structures for many, many, for, for many sentences, all the sentences you could find in all the different languages you could find. So here's a dependency structure for a sentence in English. John threw out the old trash sitting in the kitchen. And what I mean by a dependency structure is there's some head word associated with that whole sentence through, and it has dependence, John, out, and trash. And then we have dependence of trash here, of old and the, and sitting, and, and so on down this uh, phrase structure, which is a dependency structure. 
And, 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 and there's actually two ways you might word this idea in English this way and this other way, John threw an old trash sitting in the kitchen out, which is an awkward and weird way to word, to word that. And plausibly the reason that one sounds weird is because there's a longer dependency, a longer average dependency length because of this really long connection between throw and out. It, basically, if you have a choice in a language between two dependents uh, having to occur on the same side of a, of a head, it's better to put the short one closer to the head then and and then the average dependency length will be uh will be shorter and so this is a case where i'm putting the short thing after and then that that means it has to be after this very long thing and it makes the dependency it makes this one sound bad so that's a hypothesis as to why these things sound bad and um what richard did was take dependency corpora from the university dependencies tree bank universal dependencies tree bank which was at that time well actually he it wasn't quite built at the time. And so he had like, I think, you know, 25 languages there. And then he had to do a whole bunch on his own. But now there's like 58, 56 languages in that universal dependency corpora. And um, he took for any, there's like a bunch of these structures in, uh, in any language for each sentence. There's one for each sentence. And so like, say this was an example from English. It's actually not an example from the English dependency corpora, but say it was. Then he took the head of the whole sentence, that's through, and its dependents, John, out, and trash. Okay, that's four things. And compare that, the way, it's, the way it actually occurred, to some random scrambling of those four words, okay? And then do that scrambling for all the dependents going down the tree. So take trash, it has a bunch of dependents, scramble all of those around in some random way. And then, and then, and then do that, and of course there's nothing below, all, to do that for sitting and so on, all the way down, wherever there's a dependent of a word which has a dependent, just go all the way down the tree. And then, so the idea is, and you do that a hundred times for every single sentence going down, every time you have a choice, just randomly scramble them for, and you had a hundred times. And so that's like idea of like, well, this is like some baseline way that people might've wanted to say the same thing in some arbitrary language. And so we're gonna compare it to the way it was actually said in English or in whatever language is being produced here, okay? And so that's like a baseline to compare dependency lengths in English against some control for English, okay, or whatever other language. And so it's actually a little more conservative than that, what he did. He actually said, no, not any scrambling, only scramblings which pres preserve what's called projectivity. So you can't have cross dependencies. It turns out that having cross dependencies um, isn't something that human languages typically do. It's pretty, it's very rare, and it, it, it makes dependencies much longer as well. And so this, like, Ramon Ferry, Ferry Concho has a nice paper back in 2004 or five or something showing that if, um, maybe, maybe part of the reason why we have project projectivity in language, why we have no cross dependencies or very few, is that um, we want to keep dependencies close. So he, so Richard was like, okay, let's not, let's only look at projective ones and still compare. And so this is, all the languages he had access to back in 2015, which is 37 languages. And so where's English? I'm trying to find it. Here's English. I mean, there, there are, I'm sure Greek is here too. Where is Greek? There's modern Greek. It must be here. I don't see it. There it is. There it is. So it looks like English. These things all look the same. Okay. Even, even have ancient Greek. Okay. So in English, we see this red line is that very conservative baseline. And so on the X axis here is the sentences getting longer and longer. So this is like 50 word sentences and not very many of those. So we're talking about most of these sentences, most of the data points here between, so between, you know, zero, you know, 10, five words and, and 30 words is how these sentences typically, typical lengths. And you see that the baseline is much longer on average than what actually occurs. That's the blue line. The green line is if we chose the optimally close thing every single time. So that's, that's, that's the optimal baseline. Languages don't do that. So we don't have free word order in any language, like totally free word order. We have constraints. And so that's an interesting question is that what are those, so why do we have non-free word order? Well, that's probably having to do with learnability, right? Having, it's a lot easier to learn a language if we have some rules about how we, how we do things and we do them the same way. It's probably pretty hard, a lot harder plausibly, if we don't have any rules at all. And so, um, so that's why it's not, none of these are right at baseline, but in, interesting, English is pretty close to baseline. Most of the languages, well, all of the languages are between. So no language is even at this random, it's not random, it's a conservative baseline. Um, uh, every language is below that. So every language is dependent, minimizes dependencies to some degree. Um, you know, I should say, you know, there's some of these languages don't have much data. That's just, you know, we just, the corpora weren't very big at the time that these are parsed corpora. They're not just 
random corporate, these are, someone has to go hand parse all the stuff. And so some of the, for some reason, some of these just weren't very big. You know, ancient Greek and in Latin, of course, are, are not languages that are spoken today. And so these are a little bit different from the rest in that those are poetry for the most part. You know, it's a, it's a different kind of genre. It's not maybe commu standard communication. It's um, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, art stuff. And so those might, might, but I mean, even so, they're still below these baselines, which is pretty interesting. And there's lots of interesting thing to look stuff to look at here uh, between languages. So Richard's looked at more than just these 37. I think his database is up to 55, and the and the generalization is still there. So this is another quantitative universal, which is true across all languages, as far as we can tell, that um, human that languages minimize dependency lengths to some degree. And we can and and I, actually we got a lot of press about this when this came out in 2015. Uh, some people and some press there somehow wrote about it as if this was a Chomskyan universal. We were at MIT, at MIT, of course, and so they thought, oh, it's a Chomskyan thing. And, and this is actually not a Chomskyan universal. So this is a uh, a functional universal. And uh, Chom I mean, if we want to talk about what Chomsky means by universal grammar, it's very different from what uh, we are looking at here in terms of efficiency guiding what language looks like. And so um, it's not actually um, the same thing here. Um, okay. Um, so we looked at 37 languages and we got this generalization uh, and uh, across 10, I think it was 10 families, all the same, the same results across all of them. There's lots of, so they all minimize dependency distance. I wanna say an interesting question that comes up, is it because of use or is it because of the grammars? And it's actually probably both. And so the example I'd showed you before was about use, like maybe a grammar gives you some optionality and you want to put things like saying, you know, long before short in English and, uh, you know, because I, sorry, I mean, I mean, short before long in English, you want to put the long, the long thing further away from the head uh, um, if you have an option. And so that's like a use thing, but languages also optimize in terms of their grammars. And so there's these generalizations such like such that, um, for, for example, there's, there's head, head dependent generalizations. If a language tends to have verbs before its arguments, like English, for example, then it will have, tend to have prepositions and will tend to have complementizers before its arguments. That, the, that and, and vice versa for one that comes after, for like a language like Japanese, um, you'll have ver verbs come at the end and you have postpositions and you have complementizers after their embedded clauses, okay? And so that, those generalizations, that's grammar, um, uh, follows from dependency length minimization as well. It's the, the, plausibly a reason you don't cross those things is that if you do cross them, if I had head initial in one and head final in the other, um, then I end up with very long dependencies, it turns out. Okay, so, and, and we can show that that's true here, that, that the grammar is driving this, not just the processing. Okay, so here's what I told you, <laughs> and I, I, I'm sorry, it's an hour and five. I have no trouble talking for a long time, so I'm sorry. And so this is the, the words here, words are short when they're common. That was the Piantidosi result. Uh, uh, that's just about form. And then I told you about colors. I, the idea here is that maybe words exist to describe objects and properties in the world that we want to talk about. And so that's like a communication-based idea about why we have words. And then in, in production, or compromise is probably production, uh, it's sentence structure is easy in production, such we, we want to keep our dependencies uh, close together. Okay, and then I, here's the people, I, you know, I showed you Steve, he's at uh, Berkeley now, as mentioned, Kyle's at Santa Barbara, you know, Leon was actually fundamental on that color project, and uh, Bevel at NIH, and Richard Fitzgerald's at University of California, Irvine, and uh, these are other people that have been involved in some of these projects. And so um, I'm going to stop there and hold for some questions, and I'm very happy to stay as long as people want to talk to me. So I'm going to unshare. Okay, thank you, Ted. Uh, please uh, raise the hand if you have any questions. Um, may I? I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> sure. You go to uh, participants, if you want to raise your hand, I think. Yeah, if you open the participants window, click on participants if for other people here, and, there's, and then on the left-hand side of that, there's something called raise hand. But anyway, but you don't have to, because I already see you. <laughs> May I then? Yes, please. <laughs> thank you very much for the, for the presentation, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, having you with, with us. Uh, I have a question, just a clarification question concerning your research on colors. And uh, the question is this, you, you mentioned that the, uh, you find that the only 
cross-categorial universals are, uh, is the distinction between warm and cool colors. And you correlate that with the distinction between objects and, uh, and backgrounds. But I assume that it could also be correlated with the well-known Gestalt distinction between figure and, and background. And in that sense, it might be a cognitive constraint, not a usability constraint having to do with something outside uh, <clears throat> our cognition, having to do with, you know, sea being a background and forest being a background and the sky being a background. But it might have to do with a cognitive constraint, the figure background constraint, uh, which would probably lead to different results, experimental results. For example, uh, just a thought, if you take uh, ambiguous figures, like the usual rabbit duck figure, now what you tend to recognize as a figure and not as a background, I assume, would be the one that is being colored with a warm color. Uh, the tendency will be to, for that one to be recognized as a figure in contrast to the background. Uh, does this make sense? Uh, I, I don't know. I, um... Uh, kind of, but I'm I'm not sure about how to use the figure ground distinction in just in just gestalt psychology as a reason for labeling, right? So the uh, like like so the we're, we're I mean I, I I get that you could do an experiment to test those things in some ways, but I don't understand the motivation for like our motivation here is like is use. So maybe the reason we're introducing words into a lack into a language, right? Is that I have two objects, maybe I've got two goats, and one of them's brown and one of them's white, and I want to tell you which one I, I want you to, you to we want, mm -hmm. I want you to get the brown one, not the white one. So I need a word to tell those apart. That's, I don't know about how, I, like that's, that's the motivation for it here. I'm not sure about the figure ground, how that, like it's, again, the figure ground feels like a thing about vision and not about like interacting with the world. And so I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying I, I, I see plausibly how the the use thing will will create will 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 bring words into the language. I'm not sure how the figure ground one brings them in, and I could see how I, that's. Do you, do you understand my question, or am I? Am I, um, I mentioned anymore? the figure ground because I think of the figure ground as a cognitive of a uh, constraint of the type of uh, Berlin K and that tradition, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, you were not so uh, diplomatic. Uh, I mean, you were. <laughs> against, uh, I understood. In your paper, I've read that you're a little bit more diplomatic. You wanted to reconcile uh, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. tradition with the, uh, but now it seems now you, you consider that to be completely wrong. So I'm just wondering if the, 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 the object background distinction could be reinterpreted as a cognitive mm -hmm. constraint, mm -hmm. in which case it will have to do with the figure ground uh, psychological or cognitive constraint. Again, bringing, bringing us back to Berlin and Kay, okay? I'm just trying to see if that works. I don't know. So I, um, I don't quite understand how to make that work, but, uh, but I, I, I should say uh, just about my style. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, uh, I do have a style where I, I'm a, I, I may sound more dismissive of things than I really intend to be. And um, I, I, I don't know how to help that. I'm just, this is how I am. And I, uh, I, I don't intend to be. And so I don't intend to be certain about anything. And I'm, I, I just, I kind of like strong hypotheses. It's kind of, but I, I don't, I'm happy when they're, if, if they can be falsified and show that they're wrong, then they're, then that's fine too. So I, I don't mean, uh, I don't, I, yeah, you, you're probably right that I wasn't as diplomatic as I might be about, uh, the the Berlin and K thing. You're right, and I, I I don't understand it fully. So like the so part part of the reason why I'm less diplomatic in a way sometimes is I don't fully understand the like I get the communication way that words can come into a lexicon. I don't quite get the the other way. And so I, I that's my I just I'm kind of missing. Yeah, I, the, okay. The, so yeah, it was a question about colors, not about style. Oh, okay, I know, but you said I was not diplomatic, and I think it's true. <laughs> you're right, and so I I just I've. I, I, I just accept that as a 
I don't know. It's, it's kind of a criticism, and I think it's fair of me. And so I, anyway, but I, I don't know what the answer. No, no, it was not. It was not meant to be a criticism. Oh, okay. really. it was a clarification <laughs> question. I just wanted to see if, uh, if you are in the cultural or um, relativist uh, camp, let's say, or something like that. Uh, I see. So I, I, I don't. I still don't understand the. So how do they come in with this figure ground, though? How do the words? I mean, maybe it's possible. I'm not. I just don't understand the hypothesis like in a in a sort of a like a implement how would i implement that i understand how to implement the the, the maybe i'm just naive here and how I, I can only understand the one i the one i understand is the functional one it's like oh i've got two objects here's the one i want to talk about i need any need a word why is how does figure ground work in that way that's what i don't understand it's like uh how does so yes there's one that's why am i labeling it i don't get why i'm labeling it that's why well i mean I, I, uh, you, you, you mentioned that there is only one cross-categorial universal that would uh, be ready to accept, right? The warm, cool... Oh, uh, I, I, the, I didn't mean that at all. So that was something I should co correct you. I just said that we observed So probably that I misunderstood. But uh, uh -huh. you, you said that it was the only cross-linguistic uh, universal that you have found out. Yes, the one that we've element. measured. Yeah, so like if you go to, you know, Berlin and Kay made this original claim and that their first thing are across those 20 languages. And if you look in the World Color Survey, they just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And so, you know, uh, Kay, you know, uh, Paul Kay will certainly agree that he had to completely change his, his hypothesis. And so there's a paper called Kay and Maffey from around yeah. 1999. If you're familiar with that, it's like a really yeah. complicated story now about how languages bring in colors. And so and it actually has a warm, cool component to it, a big warm, cool component to that. But it's just really complicated now. And so and so that hasn't taken off. Like what, whenever people talk about Berlin and K, what they mean is this really old thing, which doesn't work. And so um, yeah. the one that works in a way is just, it's like there's seven stages to this thing. And there's all these, you know, if this, then yeah. that kind of thing. It's a real, seven it's more. very messy, right? And so, um, that's why I'm like, I'm not saying there aren't any other generalizations. There may very well be other generalizations in some ways. They just haven't been, um, you know, quantified uh, um, in, in, a, in a rigorous way yet. And so I, I mean, I think it's a complicated, like there's so much data in the World Color Survey. It's a, just an amazing resource. I want to say these, that it's so wonderful that they made that resource available for everyone. Yeah. But, and, and so, but we can't talk about, you know, 30 subjects worth of data from 330 colors from 110 languages in a coherent way. And so you end up making some kind of Why way generalization. Of, yeah, generalizing these things. And so they talk about it. He still would talk about it in this total order way, but it's just, if you look at the data there, it's like, oh no, that's just totally, that's not right at all. Even in his own data. And he knows that they know that. Ed, I'm um, sorry. You know, what do you do out. about that? I don't know. I, I say like, at least you get this one lovely generalization still out of theirs. Are there more? There, there could very well be more in there, and and, and I, I don't know. You know, so that's what you know. Noga Noga Zavlasky is this information theoretician from, she's from uh, Israel somewhere, and uh, now she's at MIT. Actually, she's around, and she's just she's you know working on, um, uh, you know, very nice models for trying to understand. There's a paper in PNAS from 2018 or 19 trying to figure out these relationships for how, for how words come in, and she. I mean, she makes assumptions. Every every model makes these various assumptions, and they, you know, for what what the priors are. And so maybe those are. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but they're. Uh, you know, maybe she'll find other generalizations beyond warm cool. So I I, I don't know. Okay, we should thank move you very on. much. I, I yeah. Have, yeah, yeah, I did not you. want to monopolize. Uh, yes, thank you, Spiros Mosconas. Thank you. And now uh, Yeshu would like to. Oh ask hi, <clears throat> I uh, I have a question about the uh, the word length. Uh, um, yeah perspective. And uh, we published a paper last year uh, with the title Economy of Effort or Maximum Rate of Information. So, so it, it's an alternative perspective or alternative explanation from the Zips explanation using uh, economy of effort. So what we argued with acoustic data, with, with the articulatory data, that in fact from a phonetic perspective, uh, the uh, the most basic currency in speech is time rather than effort. So the effort we use on the, during speaking is, is actually uh, trivial, but we are really pressured for time. And we can see a best example today because you have so much to talk about and you have to talk very fast, but still you can't finish. 
Uh, and then that can explain why we want words to be short. Uh, so I'm not sure if you've considered that. So what is, I actually don't understand the alternatives here. So I sort of think of what you're saying is very similar to what, what I was saying. How are they different? What is the difference here? So effort versus time, I sort of think, um, so you're saying it's not effort, but I, I did I ever say it was effort? I sort of time it seems like a reasonable no, the, alternative. You didn't as well. use it, but the Zip's uh, original explanation is that, of course, it depends on how you define effort. If you define mm -hmm. effort in, in terms of the oh, amount, oh, of, oh. Uh, amount of effort you spent on, that would include time. But if you're talking about articulatory strength, then effort is definitely not okay. the, the key issue. So okay. the most so valuable talking, thing is time. So. I see, I see. So well, that's like consistent then, right? That's consistent. Yeah, so, is, so there's like a different, there's different ways to measure um, uh, economy, what you're saying here. It's different ways of, of, of easiness. easiness. And, and we, you're saying a better way to measure easiness is in terms of how much time I take to, to speak as opposed to some other measure which I don't fully understand whatever effort is. You're saying, um, I'm not sure what the measure of effort is. No, we had specific measures. We actually show that for those items that are produced short, for example, the unstressed syllables, we actually, yeah. speakers actually put in a lot more effort in order to, to just say that. Uh -huh. But what, so what is effort? effort? When you say effort, what is effort? Muscle effort. And how do you measure uh, that? Uh, we, we, we measure the, uh, um, maximum velocity divided by the amount of change you made. And so these are experimental things. Right, yeah. Right, so is. you're doing experiments in particular uh, environments and you're finding that the way that people produce right, things right. is not driven by something like muscle effort compared to how much time, and, that, and the time is right, better. Right, okay, right. Okay. So, yeah, so I put possible. the, uh, the uh, reference in the chat box, so it's a- uh, Yeah, no, I, I see right it. I, that's why I was looking year. over to the right. I was looking at that reference. And so I was trying to look it up while I was talking to you. And so there you go, I can't. But it's hard to do two things at once. So I, I, that I, I, that sounds very reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, George Markopoulos. Uh, first of all, as director of Forensics Computational Linguistics Lab, I would like to thank you for this kind acceptance to give this uh, very interesting lecture to us, and also. Thank the Experimental Linguistic Society and especially Antonis Botinis for this occasion to uh, enrich us with your thoughts and your uh, current research. And uh, returning to the very interesting discussion about the color and the universality, which uh, Berlin K um, in their papers, in their paper for, from 1969, uh, tried to uh, claim that is uh, amongst all languages. Uh, I made a very interesting PhD research with my student about this uh, uh, universality claim in Greek, in modern Greek. So we, we did do two experiments in beta basic colors, and then we tried to, to, to test this hypothesis on the compound colors in Greece. In Greece, we can have compounding colors with two constituents, which are actually coordinated compounds. We can say, for instance, uh, portocalo cochino, uh, which is orange and red together as a, as a color. And then uh, the opposite one, because our coordinated structures, you can say also cochino portocalli, which is also red and orange. And we had uh, um, uh, 50 informants to claim this uh, hypothesis about the right hand, uh, right hand uh, headed rule uh, from Williams, which uh, claims that the, the head of the compound is to the right. So we expect that the color right uh, portocalo cochino, which is orange red, it's a kind of red, and the color like uh, yellow green, hydronoprasina, it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of uh, green. Uh, actually, the experimental results show the exact opposite. Uh, the perception from the, from the subjects, from the informants, was, was that the head was on the left. So, uh, 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 orange and yellow or orange and red uh, color is a kind of orange and uh, green and yellow color is a kind of, of kind of green and not of uh, yellow and this is actually very interesting because it doesn't uh, match the, the it's it's close to what you claim about the you know uh, warm versus uh, cold uh, perception yeah. can, can you um, elaborate something there so um, 
what exactly was the design of the experiment? So how do you, so there's two different groups of people, people labeling, and then there's people doing some comprehension based on those labels, is no, that no, right? Or? People who had the Mansell the Mansel color, uh, the Mansell palette, color palette with 330 cells. Yep. And they, the people pointed at the cells, okay. We asked them about the color first, the basic color. Yeah. We had the variation, a variation in, in, um, from, from the majority of uh, speakers who had variations about the basic colors, of course. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't point to the same color, everyone, on the same cell, I mean, the same chip, okay? Yeah. We asked them about the blue and they, they, they point to different blues on the Marcel uh, palette. Yeah. And then we, do this, we did the same with the, comb with the compound colors. Uh, so you ask them, so, yes. so it's, ju it's just a comprehension experiment then, there's no exactly. production. So you're just asking people about these compounds. So you ask them about the, the, um, the basic, color, basic color terms in there in the, um, in the Berlin K definition or whatever, but it's like a single word ones. And then you ask about the compound ones. The and, then, ones. and then the compound ones, I'm just a little confused. So I just want to make, be clear. So you're asking about say yellow green and, or, and you ask about green, yellow, right? These yeah. two things. And you find that, is this, this is pretty fascinating. You're saying that when I choose yellow, green, it tends actually to be over to the, to the yellow side. And exactly. when I choose green, yellow, it tends to be, that's, I, 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 so that's, you know, for whatever it's worth, when we get task, when we do this task, I run this task in English and I run this task in Spanish and I run this task in Chimani and Chimani don't do that. Like the Chimani speakers don't use compoundy things typically. Yeah. They don't, but um, they do lots and lots of things, but they don't do that. English speakers do that. You're right. You're absolutely right. And Spanish, they will do stuff like that. And we take that as we, we take the right as being the head <laughs> when we, they, they don't do it very much in their production. So maybe, maybe it's less than, you know, it's probably like 2% of trials or something over all the trials, because most of the trials just aren't near any border. Right. So most of those things, but when they do, we take them to mean, like if I, if someone says to me, it's, you know, yellow, orange, I'll say, oh, okay, they mean orange. And you're saying that actually that perceptually goes on the other side, which is pretty yes, fascinating. Greek, Greek, yes, okay. In Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what to do with that. That's super. So what, what, what does that mean? That sounds very interesting as a result. I don't understand what it means exactly. What, what are you doing with that? So that's like, seems like a linguistic question about what the head is. Is yes, that right? Uh, we wanted, wanted to test the hypothesis of right head, right, uh, right uh, yeah. head uh, rule, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And so, so the word order in Greek is just like English, similar to English. Is that right? Or, uh, and so it is normally right-headed, but right. yet uh, normally all the compounds, the the phrasal. So the, adjectives come before the head. They I, I say, oh. yes, yes. Exactly. Well, that's pretty weird. Yes. Thank you for that observation. That's interesting. Right. It's very interesting. Thank you very much, also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, George. Uh, we also had some comments uh, on the chat window from Letitia and uh, you both. I don't know if they want to elaborate. Oh, uh, I mean, so um, the first one, Lubyov, that one? Yes. Reminds uh, me of Russian. Yeah, I can tell mm -hmm. you, you know, there's a lot about. So the Sini and Golubov, this is this Russian, has the Russian blues. There's a lot of work that's been done on Russian if people, like not in, this is in, so there's a famous paper by uh, John Winower and a bunch of other people and Lara Borodivsky from, from 2007 where they actually used Russian to investigate um, uh, the differences between Russian and English speakers' perception of the same blues, okay? So, so the same colors, but English doesn't have two different words. So English just has light blue and dark blue. Most English speakers don't have any other words in that space. But I mean, Russian has, you know, Sinyi and Golubov. So Sinyi is say light blue and Golubov is this dark blue. And, and those are just, those are basic terms. Those are terms everyone knows in the, in the Russian, in, in, who speak Russian. And what they found was, uh, this is a perceptual question. So it's like, it's an interesting question. Like uh, the question I'm interested in, we're, we're talking about here is, you know, why do languages do that? Why do languages start introducing that? And I, I mean, so I haven't pushed this, but I, I haven't made this clear, but I think you know, our hypothesis would push the reason that you do that is you have dyes. You have ways to make industrialized objects which look 
different. And so maybe Russian, and there must be, I mean, if our hypothesis, you push it really strong, it has to be because there's like dyes, which are light and dark blue, and they're, and, and they're maybe associated with different social classes or something, which make them really important for, um, for some other reasons. And, and for some reason in English, that hasn't happened, even though now, you know, of course, in modern, in the modern industrialized world, more and more, there's more and more dyes available. We should, we should distinguish Light, you know, light is available in all wavelengths and we can see all different colors. So if we look at a, sky, at a, at a sunset, all colors, many, many colors are available to see what, but, but we don't have ways of making objects out of those colors for the most part, you know. So to get, you know, beautifully saturated colors uh, in objects, we need a dye. We need some stuff which is we can add to some things to, to put on or um, to make something that, that looks like that particular color. And People often think, oh, you can make, a, make something out of any color. Well, you can't, actually. It depends on, like, people are discovering new ways, you know, you know year by year, how to make different colors using different objects, use, using different materials in the world. And so you'll sometimes find, you know, there's a recent, recent research, like last year, where we found a way to make the blackest black that was ever made before. And it just looks very different from any black that you've ever seen. If you've seen this, it's just amazing how dark it is. And so it just absorbs all light. And so, but... Many and so maybe I'm guessing that Russian. That's a question I'm interested in. Is like maybe they, you know, whoever historically there may be some dye that was, you know, was available to make clothes or something in there. Which may, maybe I don't know. That's that pushing that. But to go on to this, just to answer this, that if you, you should read that, the, there's a ni very nice paper by Winower shows in the a different question. Right, the question now is the Worfian question. In case you're interested in that, which is like if you have words to distinguish light and dark blue. Do you see these colors a little differently? And what Boroditsky, what uh, Winnower and Boroditsky show is that people are a little faster at being able to um, tell if a color uh, matches another color if they happen to have, uh, and it's across a boundary, than if you don't have that color word. So for, for Russian speakers are a little better at that task than English speakers. If it happens to cross Sinigula boy, than if it's crossing light blue, dark blue. Light blue, dark blue is not a category for English. I mean, you can make it a category, kind of, but it's not, it's not a very salient one. That's a different question, though, right? That's the, I mean, it's a neat question, uh, but it's a different one. <laughs> uh, Professor Bolinis? Where is he? She is. Yes. Uh, thank you for this presentation, Ted, and... Uh, I have a lot of questions and comments indeed, but I will try to combine them short. Do you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, first, the humane principle. We want to do the maximum with the least effort, which is Andre Martinez. Uh, economy principle, all Marbers, Bertil Marbers, laziness principle. Well, here we have the speaker and the listener. The speaker wants to articulate quickly without effort, but the listener wants distinct speech in order to understand for his own business. So we have a trade-off here, and this is all over languages in all components. Now, if we go to the word principle, you say short words. Yes, yeah, sure, it's economic, it's easy, but then we should consider something else. The phonetic system of the language, I mean to say, if we, had, if we had 100 phonemes, we could have short words, a lot of them, but we cannot produce distinctive many vowels, for instance. The listener wouldn't understand them. It would be difficult for us it would be difficult for the listener, right? Absolutely. We all agree, but here come some other problems 
What do you mean word? I mean to say it is something we learn at school or we find in the dictionaries when we learn a foreign language and it's very useful, but we never, never, never perceive words. In reality, we have complete meanings. Who wrote the letter? Maria. Maria is a word, but it is a full meaning because we don't perceive speech window-wise. We should be blocked. We have short and long memories and we, when we are sure that we have perceived, understood the meaning, then we move on to the next. In this case, there are no ambiguities in language or they are minimal. If you say break, hmm, it may be ambiguous. It's not because it is another thing, break my promise and break my leg. But when we hear break, we don't define what we have heard. We wait. So break, break my leg, then we finalize our perception to the end of the meaning. And this is the strength of communication. Moving now a little bit, those are comments and questions at the same time. Now, uh, hey, can I respond to those? So, can I just respond to those two, those two points? Or okay, uh, one minute. Uh, going now to the colors. When you say, for instance, blue or light blue, uh, red or dark red or whatever. So, I don't think if we have two words. We have two morphological words, but red is one meaning and light red is one meaning. Although you have two morphological words. So what I mean is we use morphology in order to communicate, to fulfill some communicative meanings and not so in language words are the means it's not something tangible what do you say about this okay well there is at least two maybe three points there so the first one is you know what what are these basic units and i when i say word i actually um I, I, it depends on who I'm talking to as to what I what I what I say about that. And so here it's like so you you know and some of this group knows that word is not a thing. Okay, a word is not a thing. And and I I just use words because most people if you go to a computer science department I, they don't want to they don't want to they don't know that. And so like I you many of these people here understand that the notion of word is defined by a writing system for the most part. And so the writing system is like, oh, it's where we put spaces between these things. And so a word in English is different from a word in German because for some reason the German writing system has decided that we throw all compound nouns together into single word and English separates them. And then if you go to like Mandarin, there's like no words at all, apparently. And so because they just know there's no spaces at all. And so this is, so what I mean is morphemes, but the problem when I say morphemes, so morphemes are the minimal meaning units, okay? And so the problem with morphemes in practice, when I'm looking at words, in, I'm actually looking at words in, um, in, these, in these relations. So what, what I think we care about in the dictionary, what are we storing? We're storing morphemes. We're storing minimal meaning units, which are sometimes are, um, are, are the things which can't be broken down at all. And, and this is where we get into like interesting questions about what the structure of the human language mechanism is. And I sort of think a, a construction grammar approach to that in, uh, is, is the right way to go here, such that um, there's, a storage, there's a storage computation trade-off such that, yes, we can figure out what the minimal meaning units are, like, the, like, say, like a dog has no parts to it. So the word dog has no parts to it. It's not de plus a plus good, it's just dog. But dogs, maybe, is dog plus, and the dog is the plus dog, maybe. 
But sometimes if I use them so much, I may store them as one unit. You know, if I, so that's like the question of what sequences are actually stored. And so, but that minimally more morphemes are in there. And then the thing, the, the things in, in the human dictionary, and then probably much more than that is in there. And so that's a kind of what the, what the notion is. But I, I sort of didn't work up from that because I don't have you know, experimental tests of that. And so the, like for me, if I'm looking at length, say between the, the relationship between word length and um, predictability or some other measure, I, or, or some length, you know, morpheme length or something, I, what I have unfortunately or whatever is words because that's what we have in, these, in, you know, in Google. You know, Google is giving us things which are giving us the sequences of, of things between spaces. You know, if I had it parsed down to, um, morphemes in some way then i could we would predict the same thing that you know the the length of a morpheme should be uh sort of minimal meaning you it should be you know longer in less predictable uh, context we're just using whatever is available here to evaluate something i don't have a notion i i understand your complaint there about words and i accept it and we we agree with you we're just engineers at some point here we have to make a decision to in order to test things in some big way so that's one, I agree, words are not a thing. <laughs> Two, I could totally agree with you about your efficient communication idea. And in fact, we've, you know, Steve Panadosi wrote a different paper, which I didn't talk about at all today, which is all about that point that um, human language, it's, so it's, I can't remember what it's called, but it's about um, the communicative function of ambiguity. It's kind of the point, like what seems like, a, like so that's Ch one of Chomsky's complaints about, um, about, if, um, about information theory as a way to attack human language is that it's, um, uh, you know, how, how would it explain the fact that language is ambiguous? Is his, you know, if, it was, if, if human language was efficient in some way, then we wouldn't have ambiguity. And that's just a, a, a mistake. That's, a, that's just an error of, uh, in reasoning by Chomsky in that case. Because in fact, not only is it not a problem, it's actually a, a, a feature of the system that there, so what it means is I can re, well, you said the example is break. What do I mean by break? Break is ambig ambiguous. And I'll figure out what it means given the context. And so it's like for production and for comprehension, we can reuse easy things, whatever is easy for us over and over again, uh, because it will help us in making a shorter, easier code, maybe a shorter code and an easier code also that we, the fact that we can reuse things over and over, maybe because I don't have to re-remember different things. And so, in fact, we gave an information theoretic proof that if a language, it's a very simple proof that if, you're, if context disambiguates, which it does in human language, then you're always going to have um, what, what, what looks like ambiguity out of context because you're going to reuse things. Uh, and then you're going to have, um, uh, so, you, so you, it's very, very easy to prove that. It's a very simple thing. And so we completely, I totally agree with you on, on those two points, first two. And the third one I didn't fully understand. Um, that's about this notion of morphemes and use in colors, in color terms. And that's, and so um, partly I was trying to remember those first two points when you were saying this, but I, I totally agree with you. Um, so, uh, people do stuff like, you know, dark red and, and light red and stuff like that. And, and what I have, when in our, in our work, in other people's work, they've often, uh, there's sort of two, two approaches you can take to those answers that people give. One, treat them as, as raw answers on their own, or like, so light red is different from red then, or, and dark red is different from red. They're just like three different answers. Or people categorize them all as red, like whatever the head is there, you know, and this is comes back to Spiros's question earlier is like, is that the head? I don't know. We did, people take the last noun. Um, in, in practice, I don't think it matters very much in the sense that um, there aren't very many of these, you know, so, so, so the re, for information theoretic analysis, analysis, it turns out people, when you ask people labeling 80 or in the full world color survey, 330 colors, they just don't do that very much. On app, maybe some people, an individual might, some person may want to do that. But across people, I've looked, I've run tons and tons of subjects. They don't do that. They, they they will tend to just say single word answers for the most part. So you might get three or five percent of trials like that. And so whatever you do with those doesn't really matter, frankly. Um, not that it's not interesting theoretically. I think it is interesting theoretically. It just in information theoretic terms, it doesn't mean much for our analyses. And so I don't know, what, what were you want, what did you want to say about them? I'm not saying they're not interesting. I'm saying for our analyses, they didn't matter. 
um, how we did those, but what did, what did you want to say about them? I didn't, under, I didn't fully understand what the theoretical point you wanted to make about those was. Well, uh, it's the, the thing is that we perceive speech and language in larger units and we unify those units uh, without reference to morphology. We come to a higher level. Right. Well, that's the second, that's the first point I was trying to I mean to say, excuse me, I, I mean to you. say, uh, we say, let's say, we say blue, okay? Mm -hmm. We say blue. Uh, some other language may say light blue. Some other language may say a little light blue. A little light blue is one sense, one color. And blue is one sense, one color. So here, uh, morphology deviates um, from sense and color category. So well, you, I, I think, I think we want to be careful here so that there, like there is compositionality in language, right? So you don't want to, I don't think you want to say, the, the, the extreme point of view that you're pushing there is that everything that you want to say is a single undeconstructed, has a single undeconstructed um, language way to convey that. And I think that's obviously- In some common. level, no, in, yeah. in some <laughs> level, because what one language says, uh, a little light blue, yeah. really some other language may have one just word for this. Yeah, but but I thought your point was, um, which I think is a good, the first point I think is right, is that um, we may have some minimal units, morphemes, and sometimes we use those morphemes together, multiple, and they really mean a thing that people are looking up or storing and looking up oh, and then they're yes, not actually yes. they're not deconstructing it and i think exactly. so harold ryan is like you know did some work on you know in i don't know what year it was in in morphology and dutch showing that there's these storage trade st storage computation trade-offs in verbal morpho morphology and dutch i mean he was the first is all and so like many people have shown this since and so like tim o'donnell's system his grammar is basically it's called uh what the hell is that grammar called? But that's his whole system is basically built on that by an uh, intuition that, uh, well, the idea that you, there may be minimal things, it might be very efficient sometimes to store them as minimal pieces, like say in a language like Finnish, which is morphologically very complex and it has you know tons and tons of uh, morphology and you have to store all those things separately. But if you have very little morphology, it might be efficient to store those combinations and it might be easy for you. And so that's what I took to your, your point. And I agree with that that as you use things, it may be more efficient to store the, uh, a lot, as you use something a lot, it may be efficient to, to store that whole thing as a unit. And, and, but we wanna be careful to say that that's not the, you know, we're not obviously, you know, like when I give you a sentence here, I'm generating it on the fly and I'm not storing that whole sentence as a unit and I'm, I'm just putting that sentence out there. I mean, that would be, uh, that's a crazy view, frankly. And so it has to be, there's something, it's the pieces that are being stored. And the question is, what are the pieces being stored? And things like construction grammar and whatever, um, you know, Tim Tim O'Donnell's grammar, which is, uh, I guess it's someone else's grammar before him, give, give us a, for, a formalism to think about that. And I didn't uh, specify that here. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think we agree for the most part. And I, I so I, I mean, you're saying, I'm not sure if you're saying like, you know, I, different languages might, like certainly different experiences, I would agree, would categorize colors, could, could lead to different categorizations of the color system, of, of, of mm. the color colors, depending on, you know, we may, with our experience, um, we'll have different, I, I don't know about this length thing though, you're trying to sort of fit in, I, don't, I haven't said anything about the length of these descriptions in, in the color system. There it's just about what we wanna call those basic, uni those <clears throat> basic meanings. That's a complicated question, which I don't have. Okay, an thank you. Uh, very Professor much. Botinis, Indeed. just one second. Anybody else? Yes, there is a comment from Erica on this conversation uh, in oh, yeah. the chat. And we will go back a bit for Letizia. There was a, an earlier comment. I missed that one. An observation oh. for the long distance constraints and the. Ted, you have a lot of questions. Okay, <laughs> so Erica. So I was wondering if there, that, that there is no ambiguity in terms of the speaker in the sense that- Good engagement. Right. 
I agree with this question. So that so like that's this is your your whoever this person Erica in the comment it says in the in the chat it says this is like just commenting on something I was you know you and I were talking about Antonis. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> and so I agree with you. So like you're right that the ambiguity is the problem for the listener, not a problem for the speaker. Because as a speaker, I should know what I'm talking about. Is your point? <laughs> you're absolutely right. And so uh, it's but. In the process of ambiguity, you know, you know, that's Chomsky's cl claim was that there's a problem in information theoretic terms in terms of comprehension, but it isn't a problem, uh, is is what our what of our points was. It's not a problem because if there were a problem, then this wouldn't work. Like what I'm doing right now, and what you're, I, I assume mo many of you are understanding things that I'm saying. <laughs> uh, the process of communication wouldn't work like this, and so Chomsky is making it was making it sound like it's not an efficient system language, but it's actually extremely efficient. You know, words are short when, when, to, when, when they're frequent and then when they're predictable. And, uh, you know, so anyway, so I agree with you, Erica. Yes, I, I was just that. wondering if we have to discuss efficiency differently from production and comprehension. What is efficient in terms of production, maybe it's not equally efficient in terms of uh, this is, comprehension. So we would have to to have two different metrics that's parameters right. to analyze production that's and right. comprehension. That's, right. that's where you know the whole, like when I say you know language is efficient or something, I, I I try to be explicit in saying that I you know you're what you're pointing out is that's not defined right. The definition I never defined efficiency, and so I was relying on some sort of notion in some way. And so what I mean by efficiency is there's something about keeping the code short. You know, it's something about easiness in some way or other, but you're absolutely right. And then, and then, and then Antonis Aton brought up, and, and various other people brought up this question of, you know, what's easy for me um, uh, to produce may, uh, you know, th th these, like, uh, I guess, different aspects of the context that may, may affect that uh, in various ways. So that there's efficiency is not defined, you're right. And there's these trade-offs between well, what's what's easy to produce and what's easy to comprehend? You're absolutely right in these things, and so uh, and so and then I brought up another point earlier, which was, you know, regularities. You know, we didn't. I haven't talked about acquisition, right? You're probably regularities make things easier to acquire. If we don't have regularities, they're harder to acquire, probably. And so that's where, like, having regularities of word order. Why do languages have such regularity in word order? They're not. You know, there's like people talk about languages being free word order. Well, no language is actually free word order. There's high cons even in Russian, even in Walpuri, which is this famous free word order language, free supposed free word order language of you know, uh, Australian you know, Aboriginal language, it has constraints on word order. And, um, and so, for example, it's like, it's very projective. So all these languages are projective. And so there are constraints. And, um, and probably those are for learnability reasons as well. And so this is kind of a, all I'm trying to do here uh, initially is trying to push the communicative efficiency of communicative communication efficiency and memory stories, uh, you know, make them people aware that those things are probably pretty plausible as, as, as reasons for why languages look the way they do. Although I'm not giving you a complete story, you know, at all. And that's like where I'm hoping people like you <laughs> and people like my ex students, my students and so on, will figure these things out. And I haven't given you a model of anything, right? There's no computational model at all here yet. So where of anything. And so we would need like a model of learning and a model of processing and what that actually predict, predicts, and I haven't done any of that. I've just shown correlations, you know, and those are very, those are informative. They're not useless, but they're, they're and it's neat that they're so strong, but um, they're not a model. Okay, anyway. thank you. Yeah, and so, okay. let, now for, for yeah. Leticia, there was a comment. Yeah. Oh. Uh, about, uh, an uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, I was just wondering whether you, you see any convergence between what we will show as information processing efficiency in terms of locali locality constraints and what Chomsky has been calling the third factor in the minimalist program. Um, I don't know what the third factor in the minimalist program is, so can you tell me what that is so I could... I can, I can well, <laughs> it would be principles uh, independent from the faculty of language that uh, constrain the form of the language works. Well, if he's saying that things independent of language are constraining language, that's what... Yes, uh, that's yes, two, 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 of, two thousand 
in 2005. Okay, well, I mean, that's what, this, so that's what these are. The these in, are... The, in the paper called the three factors in language design. Yeah. So the first factor would be something genetic. The mm -hmm. second fact, factor would be historical. And the third factor would be faculty of language independent principles that constrain the form of the language work. And so I, I wonder whether there is a big convergence between your arguments and this view. It could be. So, I mean, I don't know. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I have a strange relationship with Noam, with Chomsky. And so uh, where I've, I, I have talked to him several times and I find him very disagreeable. And so I, uh, I don't, I can't, um, he's just, I just can't interact with him. He just, uh, he's not, um, he doesn't seem, I, so I don't know what he, I don't understand his, uh, I understood Chomsky in the 50s and the 60s, I read a lot, I've read a lot of stuff he's written. I understand remarks of normalization. I understand subjacency from 1977. I understand lectures on government binding. But when he starts talking about, you know, efficiency and language, and uh, I have a hard time knowing what he's trying to, to figure out and whether it's quantitatively evaluate, evaluable or not. And I don't, I don't really know. And so, um, I've had a hard time interacting with him. I feel like he's just trying to argue with me. <laughs> I can never put anything on the table and say, we agree on this, right? And he's like, no. And so I just don't know. I don't know. I, I would hope that he would agree, well, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't I, know. I, I think that is, it's, that it's very similar. <laughs> the, the third factor goes okay. very well with your argument. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, even though I'm at MIT, and so we know each other. I mean, he's gone now. He's gone. He's moved to Arizona. But he, I've known him for many, many years, and we don't. Um, I just uh, his style is a little different from mine, and so uh, our and I don't really get it. And so, uh, so the things I don't get about Chomsky, if case people care, is is that he doesn't do quantitative evaluations of anything, and so I don't quite like anything that he does it's like it's always his intuitions on something and never like a corpus or or like you know some quantitative evaluation of some of some claims and and so um he just doesn't do that and he has never pushed that and he I, and he's actually openly said it's worthless and uh i i just completely disagree coming from some you know a different background i agree but i just like the thing is, I've learned that my intuitions are are much more worthless than data from from uh, from from many people. Like I, I, my intuitions can be very malleable on the situation. I like I like to be right, <laughs> and, and and so then if I like to be right, that means I can't be trusted, and uh, and so um, I need to get some independent evaluation of and, and which is quant quantitative and so i he doesn't do that and he doesn't push that and so we just sort of i think that's a methodological like big difference between um yeah. him and and me and so we uh i you know i don't know what to you know i don't really get it and so sorry but, I, I, so he made the things he's saying may be very compatible okay but i i i bet if you ask him He'll say they're not, <laughs> and I won't know why either. <laughs> but then, this this is the point. Uh, this is the point. This is this is our with experimental linguistics. I mean, we really need uh, intuitions and theoretical uh, aspects of course, of course. in order to test. Of course. If we yeah. don't have intuitions, we can't test anything. And then, experimental linguistics, we test. And then we give uh, food for application. So we are in the middle. Here we have intuitions, theoretical things. We are experimental linguistics, and then we have applications. We are in the middle. On the other hand, we feed back theoretical linguistics with our experimentation and our insights. So that's our function. We have a central role in the development of linguistics as a science, as well as for diverse applications. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I'm I, like, I end up getting uh, people, people get upset with me for the harsh way I say things. Like I say it maybe in a harsher way than you do. Like I, I, someone, no, as right. Piro said earlier, I was not diplomatic. Oh, it's, it's, things, it's, it's, it's perfectly right. I like okay, okay. I'm not the most so diplomatic. Well, I know, like the MIT. No, 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 no. Because, because uh, 
you would make my life difficult if you were otherwise because what you say understand it directly i mean if you if you are diplomatic i will have to work a lot in order to understand you so we said minimal economy principle well okay okay one last question from irene ah, she has raised okay. her hand one last question yeah. from irene vogel yeah hi thank you great um talk and also discussion i just have a maybe a quick question so in in the beginning you're talking about this correlation between uh shorter words and predictability and yes. i'm wondering how you think we get there so um do we think oh well that's something that's going to be really common so i'm going to pick a short word to put there or do you think that maybe we have these expressions that maybe start out longer and then we shorten them because they become more and more common? Do you have any um, thoughts on that? And I'll just make one more comment. Why bother with yonder when we can say over there, which is only one syllable? Um, good. Well, so let's start with that second one. I mean, I, I think that's historical. So, so the way that, uh, well, I can start with both of them. They're both the, sim the similar kind of questions, actually. And so, the I so I, I we have so your question is you know where why do we have this relationship I I mean I you know uh, for one thing it's a very small correlation it's just but point three or something this relationship between predictability and word length so there's like tons of other stuff going on in why words look the way they do or why morphemes look the way they do and Thomas <laughs> and so whatever like there's a, there's a small but very maybe p potentially useful a correlation um, I haven't explored you know how that happens but other people have and so i'm trying to uh find this paper by i can't remember what her name is she was at edinburgh argawal or something like this and she did this neat paper in uh cognition in 2017 or something like that which showed over the course of google books corpus how so what happens to lots of you know novel words they come into a language and um depending on whether they get into big use or not they often shorten okay so things like there's a lot of history of english for example like so moving pictures became movie eventually you know and so i don't know automobile became car i don't know what happened in between there but there's a lot of but old stuff uh so i get you know uh, i don't know what happened with you know there's tons of examples like this of words that come in and so she was exploring this actually basically looking at and, and rate of usage and how rate of usage affected length. And there was a very strong relationship between um, the rate of usage and the length. And so it looks like there's some, you know, God knows how a word comes into a language to start with. There's some accidental weird stuff. It hap if it happens to be very long and it happens to be um, used, used a lot, when it gets used a lot, then they shorten. And so there is a process there going on for, for content words. It's very interesting for, you know, function words are just, they don't come in. I mean, so, I, you know, it's hard to look what's going on there in the function words. They're just, they haven't changed much in the last hundred years. You know, I, I don't know if they've changed at all in English, for example. We don't have very much quantitative data of English. I mean, we do have some, uh, it's just smaller, much smaller corpora. If you go back, uh, you know, 500, you know, to, to middle and old English, we have some, but it's not that much of, of how words, other kinds of words are coming in. And so we can't look at that kind of correlation, but we can uh, look at this in, in Google Books in the last 100, 120 years, 100, something like that. And so that it does look like that's happening for some, for content words. So that's good. And so I don't know, yonder, so it's probably, my guess is yonder. Oh, that's like an inter very interesting question about, about that domain, about how we talk about um, distances. And so, I mean, I, that sounds like an old word to me. I bet it was common, you know, you know I don't know why it is we, we've stopped talking about, uh, that you know, it's it maybe probably has something to do with the culture, right? So something to do with how people are interact. I mean, because yonder feels like something where I'm walking outside, uh, you know, in the in the field in the um, uh, like the like the, the typical meaning for that is something to do with like you know over mountains and stuff or like over like and so I you know I don't do that very much and you know we don't we don't do that very much anymore and so maybe that's what it's do. I'm making something up here, so. Yeah, anyway. it does sound a little poetic or something, but don't yeah. we also, I mean, I don't use it at all, probably, but um, what about over yon? Don't we sometimes, don't some people shorten yonder to yon? Maybe. And say over yon, and that would be shorter even, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that would be okay for us too. Because <laughs> it's yeah. very predictable in that context, so that would be okay. The shorter, the better, if it's predictable. And so, in this story. Thank okay. you. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ted. And big applaud for Ted. A big applaud, please. <laughs> thank you, Antonis. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and now, an announcement. Uh, we will have the opportunity to meet and talk with Ted uh, in Athens next year. Uh, we will have uh, the 12th Conference of Experimental Linguistics and Ted is one of the invited speakers. Thank you all of you for your participation and next meeting uh, after the new year. Uh, with my best wishes for a, for a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very Bye. much for coming. Bye-bye.